morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to the live program number 168 at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is distinguished faculty, Dr. Rishi Dhir from the United Kingdom. Dr. Dhir completed his training on the Royal London Rotation, attaining his FRC Strom in Orthopedics in 2016. He has since completed prestigious fellowships in Bridington, Edinburgh, and Melbourne, Australia in upper limb surgery. His great experience in FRCS training, running his own company, Let's Talk Doctor, producing groundbreaking teaching materials and organizing the FRCS mock exams in the UK, publishing various educational texts, convening numerous courses, and mentoring a lot of students, both local and international. Today, it's my great honor to bring back Dr. Richie there for this fantastic live program. Over to you, Rishi. Thank you, Hitesh, and thank you very much, Orthopedic Principles, for having me. It's a fantastic initiative, um, and I'm very honored to be here to speak to you guys. Um, as Hitesh said, I, my specialty is really FRCS, and with the topic of infection and theater design, it's such a wide-ranging topic that it was difficult to condense into a small uh, amount of time. But what I'm going to focus on today is some of the main points that I think you need to know for the exam. And, and obviously, it's great during the pandemic to have the opportunity to learn from other surgeons as well around the world. So I'm so, sure you'll have areas in your local practice which will differ, and I'd be very interested to hear from those as well. So, so let's start with infection and theatre design. What do I want you guys really to learn from the exam? Well, I want you to know a little bit about infection, particularly some of the common bacteria. I want to understand about some of the weapons that we have at our disposal, and how we choose certain antibiotics and how they act. And in particular, if you were asked to design your own theater, how you would do that and what principles you'd be looking at as well. So let's start with bacterial infection. In the exam, they will often ask you to draw a bacterium. And we're not looking for some major artistic thing like the Mona Lisa or Leonardo da Vinci. Just keep it very functional in your diagram. So some important points to note is that a bacterium, basically, it has a cell wall. It does not have a nucleus. Instead, you get this circle of DNA, which is called plasmid, and that contains special genes, which, for example, may confer antibiotic resistance. There are some important enzymes, including DNA gyrase and RNA polymerase, and there are ribosomes as well, 30S, and 50S. And these are the main sort of protein factories which produce the main proteins which give bacteria its specific identification. It moves by a flagellum as well. So it's kind of a motile structure which allows movement of the bacterium. So I just want you to remember that overall structure. Now, if I was, for example, in the middle of the night asked to see a patient and I was worried about septic arthritis, I might take an aspiration from that joint and I might send it for a gram stain. And this is a test that we usually do in the UK. It's quick. We can normally get a result back within an hour. And it gives us a rough idea of what type of organism that we're dealing with. And if you have a positive gram stain, you can basically treat them for septic arthritis as well. So the question they may ask you in the exam is, how do you do a gram stain? And there's three buzz phrases that you need to remember. So... The first one is a crystal violet indium dye. The second one is saffronin O. And the third is alcohol rinse. So you basically take the bacteria, you take your specimen, and you soak it in a crystal violet indium dye. You then wash it in alcohol rinse. The gram positive bacteria will retain the dye, but the gram negative do not. You then counterstain the bacteria in saffronin O, and these will stain pink under the microscope. So the gram positives will look purplish or violet. The gram negatives will look pink. We then further subdivide the bacteria on whether they look rod-shaped, which are called bacilli, or whether they look like clusters of grapes, which are called cocci. So Again, as I said, bacilli look rod-shaped under the microscope and cocci look like grapes, okay? 
So you will need to know some basics about the different types of bacteria. And I've broken it up into gram positive and gram negative and cocci if they look grape shaped or bacilli if they look rod shaped. So I've just listed these because for FRCS, remember we're not microbiologists, we're orthopedic surgeons. So we don't need to know them in detail, but we just need to sort of know what groups they fit into. So the gram positive cocci are the most common organism that you tend to meet. And these will be your Staphylococcus, your Streptococcus, or your Enterococcus, gut bacteria, okay? So that includes, for example, Staph aureus, Staph epididymis, MRSA, or MSSA. So MSSA means methylene sensitive, and MRSA means methylene resistant. Streptococcus, your Streptococcus pneumoniae, your Streptococcus viridans, or your Streptococcus pyogenes. And your enterococcus are your gut organisms like your enterococcus faecalis, okay? The gram-negative cocci include Neisseria. So that will be your Neisseria meningitidis, so meningitis, or your Neisseria gonorrhoeae, which you often see in younger sexually active patients. Gram-positive bacilli would be your spore-forming org organisms, so Clostridium perfringens, Clostridium tetany, so that's your tetanus, Clostridium difficile, a watery diarrhea that's seen in people who often have inappropriate use of antibiotics, or Clostridium botulinum, okay? Your bacillus species, so that's things like your bacillus anthracis, anthrax, or your non-spore-forming organisms such as listeria or diphtheria. You also have gram-negative bacilli, and these will be your enteric organisms, your E. coli, Campylobacter, Salmonella, Shigella, things you get from food poisoning, your respiratory organisms like your Haemophilus influenzae or Bordetella pertussis, which is a whooping cough. In the UK, that's not so common because of the vaccination. And then also your zoonotic organisms such as Pasteurella. So just remember that table of bacteria and roughly what fits into each category, gram-positive cocci or bacilli, and gram-negative cocci or bacilli. So that's where the different types of bacteria are coming from. The next thing I want to move on to is how do we treat those bacteria? And that's with the use of antibiotics, okay? So the way that I remember antibiotics is I think back to that diagram I drew of the bacteria, the cell wall, the proteins, 30S, 50S ribosomes, and the nucleic acid, DNA gyrase and RNA polymerase. And I think of where do the bacteria act on those different parts? Sorry, where do the antibiotics act on those different parts of the bacteria? So first of all, those bacteria which act on the cell wall, they can interfere with synthesis of peptidoglycans. So I always think of that as imagine you're building a brick wall and that's the cell wall, the peptidoglycans represent the individual bricks. So this stops the individual bricks from being synthesized. And those include your beta-lactams. So those were your penicillins, or for those organisms which are penicillinase resistant, your flucloxacillin, for example, or your cephalosporins, okay? And just remember, penicillin G is the IV form and penicillin V is the oral form, okay? So as I said, penicillinase resistant, that's things like flucloxacillin, amoxicillin, piperacillin, and cephalosporins, which have different generations, okay? You do not need to know these in any detail for the exam, which is why I've kept it very simple. Carbapenems include things like imipenem or meripenem, and these are often for quite nasty organisms where they've often got a more severe form of the bacteria, okay? And then you've got monobactams like Astrionum. All of these are what we call bactericidal. So they kill the bacteria completely. The other things which act on the cell wall is instead of stopping the building bricks from being synthesized, they stop incorporation of the glycan subunit into the cell wall. So the way that I think of that is imagine you're trying to build a wall. Donald Trump, he loves his walls. Okay, the first type is stopping the bricks from being synthesized. The second type is stopping the bricks that have been synthesized from being put into the wall to make the wall, okay? So those ones which interfere with incorporation of the glycan subunit. 
The next type are ones which act on the proteins themselves. And remember 30S and 50S. So the ones you need to know about are your aminoglycosides, things like gentamicin. And these are bactericidals. They kill the bacteria. There are also tetracyclines, but these are bacteriostatics. They don't quite kill the bacteria, but they stop their activity temporarily. So they're bacteriostatic. Whereas those which act on the 50S ribosomes include macrolides such as erythromycin. Okay. Again, guys, keep it very simple. Remember, aminoglycosides, A is earlier in the alphabet, so acts on the 30S. M is later in the alphabet, so acts on 50S. These are silly little things that I use to help me remember. Okay. And finally, those which act on the nucleic acids. So you've got DNA gyrase. Those are your quinolones, such as ciprofloxacin, which is very good for your gut or enteric organisms. Those which disrupt DNA synthesis, such as metronidazole those which act on RNA polymerase, such as rifampicin, or those which inhibit folate synthesis, such as trimethoprim, which is a sulfonamide, okay? That is a comprehensive look at bacteria for the FRCS and antibiotics. You do not need to know it in any more detail than that for the exam. So a common question they might ask you is, they'll, they'll very rarely say to you in the exam, tell me about antibiotics. They will ask it always in the context of a clinical questions. They might say, what antibiotic do you use for your hip replacement? So I would say, well, I use kefuroximate induction. And then they might say, how does it work? So you would say kefuroxim is an example of a bacteriostatic organism, which acts on synthesis of the peptidoglycan subunits, and so acts on the cell wall of the bacteria. That's the way that you would answer it. And it's a second generation cephalosporin. So the part of the talk that I really want to focus on, and I think this is most relevant to us as surgeons, is the theatre design. Now, suppose you were given a theatre to design. There's lots of different factors that we have to consider. The first is location. Where are we going to put our theatre? Well, ideally, we want it to be close to all the hotbed areas. So it needs to be close to ITU. So we've got good ITU support, critical care available. And if we need to get somebody quickly from ITU to theatres, it's close by. It needs to have good access to A&E, so not be far from that. So your emergencies coming through the door can get to theatre close, um, close at hand. And also it has needs to have good access to sort of anaesthetic facilities or um, critical care as well. But it also needs to have different areas, a clean area and a dirty area. So the way that we split it up is we're gonna look at layout of the operating theater. We're gonna look at how do we optimize certain operating conditions. And then we're going to look at protection versus infection, okay? So let's start with the layout of the operating theater. I've already told you it needs to be close to A&E, close to critical care, close to um, uh, ITU as well, which I suppose fits hand in hand with critical care, okay? So we break the operating zone into different areas. You've got the outer zone, which basically is the rest of the hospital and the theater reception. You have the clean zone, which runs from the theater reception to the theater doors. You have the aseptic zone, which is the theater itself. It's the scrub room, the prep room, and the operating room. And you have the disposal zone or the sluice where the clinical waste is disposed of, okay? So just remember those four areas, outer zone, clean zone, aseptic zone, and disposal zone. So the next thing is, as a surgeon, how can we operate, sorry, how can we optimize operating conditions? And there's two factors that we've got to consider. We've got to consider optimum comfort for us as surgeons to operate in, but we also need to optimize and be aware of the patient as well. So there's two conflicting things here, the surgeon and the theater staff and the patient themselves. So there's four factors which we can control, temperature, humidity, lighting, and ventilation. So let's start with temperature. As I said before, there is a compromise, and that's my favorite buzzword in orthopedics, guys. There's always a compromise or a payoff. And the payoff here is between 
ensuring adequate comfort for the surgeon. So ideally, the surgeon wants the temperature to be about 19 degrees because we've got our gowns on, it's quite hot, it gets quite sweaty. Um, but remember, the patient themselves, they're paralyzed. They have an exposed wound. They're often given fluids which may be cool, cooler than their body temperature. So the optimum temperature for them will often be about 24 to 26 degrees. So how do we cope with this conflict between the surgeon temperature and the optimum temperature for the patient? Well, we'll often use a temperature of about 19 degrees, but we'll use a warming blanket or airflow mattress to create some sort of warm microclimate. And remember, increased temperature will decrease your cement working time. So I experienced this myself in the UK recently. We had a heat wave. It probably is nothing for India, but outside it was about 35 to 37 degrees. Temperatures in theatre in my hospital were not working very well. So we were operating regularly in 26, 27 degrees. And it was very uncomfortable, especially with thick x-ray gowns. I had to change my scrubs after every case because they were just saturated with water. Um, so that was very difficult. And we found that doing arthroplasty was, in many cases, often bordering on the level of being unsafe because cement was going off very, very quickly. So it does create problems if the temperatures are high in theatre. Again, humidity, the optimum humidity is about 40 to 60%. But again, if you've got increased humidity, you inc you'll decrease the cement working time. It will go off much quicker. So you have to make a compromise there as well. We can control lighting. Remember, we want lighting which is easily adjustable by the surgeon. We want some sort of artificial lighting, which basically gives excellent illumination at the um, incision site. It doesn't have shadows. And we want at least 40,000 lux. That's kind of the buzzword to give really good lighting at the operation site, okay? So temperature, humidity, lighting, and finally ventilation. These are the four areas that we can control in terms of the operating environment. So the way that I think of ventilation is think of the different sources of contamination in theater. You've got contamination from the patient, the surgical team, the instruments, and airborne contamination. So the first three, the patient, the surgical team, and the instrument, we can control in different ways, but airborne contamination is exclusively a consequence of the number of people in theater. So for example, talking will disperse airborne particles, skin shedding from the different number of people in theater um, can be dispersed. So the role of ventilation is to reduce the amount of airborne contamination and reduce the airborne bacteria. And that can be measured by the number of colony forming units per meter cubed, which is measured by a microscopic volumetric slit sampler. And cleanliness de is defined as less than 35 colony forming units per meters cubed of air, or less than one colony forming unit of Clostridium perfringens or Staph aureus per meter cubed of air in an empty theater or less than 180 colony forming units per meter cubed during an operation. And that's the target that we aim for. So I'll say that again, cleanliness, less than 35 colony forming units per meter cubed of air or less than one colony forming unit of C. perfringens or Staph aureus per meter cubed of air in an empty theater or less than 180 colony forming units per meter cubed in an operation, okay? So how does ventilation work? Well, air is drawn through roof systems and it passes through these high efficiency particular air filters, which we call HEPA filters, okay? So remember what I said, the goal of ventilation, reduce the airborne source. Remember my definition of cleanliness and remember HEPA filters, high efficiency particulate air filters. So the next question you might ask you in the exam is what are the different types of ventilation? And there's two main types, plenum or positive pressure ventilation, where you've got a higher pressure inside the theater than out. So any dirty air will get in train from inside the theater to out down a pressure gradient. But the problem with plenum is any movement in theater, such as movement of different theater staff going in and out or opening a door, can interrupt this pressure flow gradient. So it's not ideal for arthroplasty. The other one is laminar flow. 
And I just want to tell you guys as a caveat. So one of the recommendations of COVID is that you have positive pressure ventilation. So obviously with us, we're doing a lot of trauma at the moment and we're using positive pressure ventilation, but it does create difficulties when considering arthroplasty because laminar flow, we're not doing that as much anymore. We're doing positive pressure during the COVID period. So I don't know if that's different where you guys are. We can maybe have a discussion about that at the end, um, but that's an important point to consider. So laminar flow is a question they will often ask you in the exam about explaining laminar flow and how it works. It's a very, very topical conversation. So the way that I define laminar flow is you think of it as an entire body of air which is in a designated space and it moves with uniform velocity in a single direction along parallel flow lines okay and that's quite a mouthful so just say it one more time buzzword number one it's an entire body of air in a designated space uniform velocity single direction parallel flow lines so five buzz phrases and it requires close to a hundred percent hepa filter coverage so that's where our high efficiency particular air filters the hepa filters come in and there's three types of laminar flow this horizontal laminar flow which basically means the hepa filters will sit on one wall okay there's vertical laminar flow okay both of these are beset by problems that if the Airflow is disrupted by movement, etc. You might disrupt the laminar flow. Okay, so the best one is the inverted trumpet or the Howarth system, which is basically where the HEPA filters will entrain air downwards out like an inverted trumpet, and in theory away from your operating site. So that's how laminar flow works. Okay, and then finally we move on to protection versus infection okay and the way that i think of protection versus infection is what are your different gambits that you can use to protect you versus infection well we can divide it up into the following subheadings antiseptics drapes gowns masks gloves and antibiotics which we've already mentioned so i'm just going to go through each of these so what is an antiseptic well an antiseptic is a liquid which reduces the number of viable organisms. They may ask you the difference between antibiotics, sorry, between uh, antisepsis and sterilization. So antiseptics reduce the number of viable organisms, but they don't get rid of them all. Whereas sterilization destroys all viable organisms. But remember, everything in orthopedics is a payoff. We can't use sterilization on the patient's skin, or we basically burn their skin away completely. We kill all of their good flora, okay? So you're reducing, but not destroying all of the viable organisms when you prep their skin, okay? The types of antiseptics that you may need to know for the exam are these three pictures. So you've got your iodophores, like your iodine prep solution. You have your 70% alcohol, and you have your chlorhexidine, okay? So the iodophores, the iodine things like betadine, they're bactericidal, they kill the bacteria, they also act against viruses and fungi, but they're inactivated by blood, feces, and pus. The 70% alcohol, it's rapid acting against bacteria, but it's not good against viruses and fungi. So you can only really use it against bacteria and you can't use it on open wounds or mucous membranes. So you're thinking of iodine if you have an open wound. Chlorhexidin is a broad spec antibiotic. It's good, sorry, antiseptic. It's good against bacteria. It's inactivated by hand sanitizers and you can't use it on open wounds or mucous membranes. So in that case, you're using betadine. We next move to drapes and there's two types of drapes. There's what we call the non-woven body drapes. And these will be the standard drapes that you use for every case. So you've got lots of different types. You've got U drapes, you've got square drapes, you've got holy drapes, whatever you use. And then the other type you've got are these incisional drapes, which is basically they're normally used to hold down the body drapes, and they're also often betadine impregnated. But there's no evidence that they actually reduce the rate of infection. But we usually use them for arthroplasty or occasionally some trauma cases before we make our first incision to skin. Because the principle is the skin itself has some organisms on it. So you do not want to bring those organisms to the deeper layer. Okay. But 
what the NICE guidelines in the UK, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, and it may be different in India, so just check with your local guidelines. They say that if you are going to use these incisional um, drapes, that they should be iodo, so iodophore or iodine impregnated. So for example, Ioban. This is a common one that we use here for arthroplasty. Of course, if somebody's allergic to shellfish, which betadine has in it, or iodine, then you can't use these. Next, we move on to gowns. And remember, the ideal gown should be an effective barrier when it's wet, because you don't want wet when it's wet to soak through and it stops working. It should also prevent dispersion of your airborne bacteria. But at the same time, it's got to be comfortable for the user. So remember my payoff. Everything in orthopedics is a payoff. You've got to pay off between user comfort but being a good barrier, okay? So the different types you've got, basically, is, and also it's got to be cost effective. So the types that you've got, you've got your standard cotton gowns, okay, which are often comfortable for the user, but they've got a high pore size. So basically they will allow high moist bacterial strike through, which basically means if the gown gets wet, bacteria can potentially go through from your skin through onto the gown and potentially onto the patient. So they're not effective. On the other hand, Gore-Tex, which you might see in things like, um, I'm trying to think, you can get Gore-Tex in your, uh, like if you're going cycling, um, cycling gear is often made of Gore-Tex. It provides a very effective barrier as it's got a small pore size, but it would be too uncomfortable to wear in theatre. So then you've got a disposable, which is a combination of the two, a smaller pore size, but it can be more comfortable. But obviously these are expensive because they're disposable. And then you've got these body exhaust suits where there's a negative pressure in the gown and air is drawn off at the helmet by a body exhaust unit. So we use these in the UK for many arthroplasty cases. In terms of masks, do masks help? And I think masks are very topical at the moment because of COVID. So what they say is that masks tend to, and I suppose when I made this slide, this was more applicable to, um, to sort of general surgical masks, such as what we call um, uh, not FFP2s or FFP3s, but just your standard surgical masks, okay? So that's what these ones are applicable to. And what we would say is these don't really protect the wound from th these sort of masks. They basically, how do they work? They can protect the user from direct contamination or airborne contamination, but they don't really protect the operating person from you, okay? That's the key thing. It's more to protect you from any sort of blood or that type of thing from splashing through. But obviously, if you're speaking with a mask on, it's going to prevent airborne dispersion. I'd probably update that slide and say, actually, things like N95s or FFP2, they've got a 95% filtration rate. N99s or FFP3s have a 99% filtration rate. So in the UK, during the real height of the pandemic, we were using FFP3s and N99s all the time in theatre. Now it tends to be more surgeon's choice um, now that COVID cases are a little bit less and patients are being screened a lot more. Um, I find that I, I will use N95s for arthroplasty cases, sorry, N99s for arthroplasty cases like hemiarthroplasties, total hips, etc. cetera. Um, but a lot of upper limb cases, I tend to just use basic surgical masks just because of comfort. I find it difficult, um, really struggle for more than an hour wearing the real FFP3 masks. And, I'll put that to our panel at the end. I mean, what their personal experience is like with operating with the, the FFP3, because I think it's quite difficult, actually, especially the, the big visors and the FFP3s. But that's something probably to update from this slide. OK, now gloves. Gloves provide you from a secondary barrier. They protect the wound from you, but they also protect the user from the wound as well. OK, so. The way that I think of it is your surgical scrub, when you're scrubbing, you're removing lots of bacteria, but not all bacteria. So the purpose of the gloves is basically to protect the wound from any bacteria that's led over. And it also protects the user from any hematogenous contamination from the wound as well. Antibiotics, we've already discussed the different types. Remember, these can be given systemically. So we give them at induction. Okay. Some people will give post-op doses of antibiotics as well, particularly with a long case or a high-risk case, such as arthroplasty. They may be given impregnated in the cement as well, okay? But remember, if you do give antibiotics in the cement, it can change the properties of the cement as well, okay? 
And finally, the MRC trial by Lidwell in 1982. So this is a very famous trial, which you can quote in the exam. Lidwell looked at lots of different factors which basically affect infection rates in theater. And he found that the three most important factors were antibiotics at induction, systemic antibiotics, giving um, wearing body exhaust suits as well, and also laminar flow, how earth ventilation as well, okay? The biggest contributor to reducing infection are the systemic antibiotics at induction. So that's the key thing. So the important point to note is they basically need to be given five minutes before you put the tourniquet up in a TKR. And the best results if they're given within two hours of the incision, and there's no difference between giving a one day and three day course. The antibiotics have got to be heat stable, they can't be toxic, and they should not affect the physical properties of the cement. So that's why those are the important things to note. And the good thing about impregnating them in cement is it allows greater local concentrations without increasing toxicity, okay? So that's the reason why we give those. And that's just saying with the MRC trial by Lidwell in 1982, those were the three most important factors that they found in terms of reducing infection. So you can quote that paper in the exam. So the final question I'm gonna ask you is, this is a common one in the FRCS, both the UK and international. As I said to you before, they will re very rarely say, tell me about infection, tell me about theatre design. They will give it in the context of a clinical scenario. So they may say, you're a new consultant in a hip unit with high infections. What do you do? Now, the other way that I like to teach is I think about in the FRCS, particularly in the speaking exam, really try and break your answers up, compartmentalize it. So the way that I would answer this is I would divide my answer up into three main parts. Number one, do no harm, stop operating until you've investigated this properly. Number two, do what we call a root cause analysis. Try and find out what the cause of the infections are. Is it at the level of the surgeon, the patient, or the implant? Okay, well, I should, I should say surgeon and personnel in theatre, patient or implant. And then the final part of your answer is institute change. And the way that you institute change is you can divide it into pre-op, intra-op, and post-op. And then all you're doing is you're basically just quoting everything I've said. So pre-operatively, you can talk about screening the patient adequately for MRSA. You could bring in about screening the patient for COVID. You could talk about things like diabetic control. You could talk about prepping the patient in theatre, reducing the number of people in theatre, wearing masks, etc. Intraoperatively, you can talk about antibiotics induction, prepping the skin, adequate hemostasis, quick operation, gloves, gowns, etc. And then post-op, you can talk about two post-op doses of antibiotics, reduce the number of dressing changes, barrier nursing or side room nursing, etc. These are all things that you can talk about in terms of how you'd answer this question. So guys, that concludes my talk. I tried to keep it sort of short and relevant for the exam because I think it's one of those topics that can be a bit dry, but try and keep it very cl um, clinically um, uh, referenced. And listen, I'm very proud as well for orthopedic principles, uh, for the partnership that we've got and for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to talk to you guys. Um, and just to let you know, this is my website and we've got a discount code on any courses and products, especially for any guys who are part of orthopedic principles. I think you guys are doing a fantastic job and I, I love watching all the lectures and uh, thank you thoroughly for inviting me again. It's a real pleasure to speak to you. Thank you, Rishi. Yet another fantastic lecture from your side. Thanks. Very comprehensive and very much tapered to the FRC's candidates. Just a few questions. Yeah. Uh, Rishi, uh, you mentioned the laminar airflow and it's there for quite a long time. And you've mentioned about the MRC trial as well. See, there's a lot of debate off late last three years. Peter Bershoff, uh, he... Uh, published a paper in Lancet Infectious Diseases, and they did a large study, looked at a systematic review and meta-analysis, and they were really critical about the use of laminar airflow, and that sparked a lot of debate because this is a high investment area. Yes, it is. So on that. It is, and I agree, I agree with you. I, I probably should have put a slide in actually to say this is an area of controversy because I, I suppose the, the MRC trial, that's the one that everybody quotes, but it is quite an old trial now, and there is definitely some some debate about whether laminar airflow is the best thing for arthroplasty. I know in my hospital, 
we will still try and do uh, arthroplasty in laminar airflow. During COVID, we basically not had laminar flow, so we've just been using positive pressure ventilation. Uh, it's too early at the moment to say what our infection rate has been or if that's gone up or down. What, what is your experience in your, in your local hospitals, both yourself and also Centel as well? Yeah, most of us, uh, I mean, the arthroplasty centers are equipped with laminar airflow. Like mm. uh, people have not really gone into this particular aspect like last three years. It's not hit people, but uh, it's a matter of debate, right? Because I agree. Quality study and uh, there's a lot of controversy about it. Because it's I, a think, I, I think it's one of those things as well that it's kind of, I should, and I shouldn't say this, I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but it's almost orthopedic dogma. We're very much a, we're very much a slave of our training. So in training, you're always taught laminar airflow. This is what was done. And, and then it's, it's somebody coming along and questioning, well, is this actually the right thing? You know, these new studies that are coming in, and I suppose it's, it's having the step to take that courage and say, okay, well, I'm going to institute, do you know what I mean? Institute this change. Cause there's, there's a lot of things that we do in, and I do my practice with dogmatically, which you're like, actually, I don't know why we're doing that. I don't know if that is, the, but you just, it's, it's what you've kind of been taught to do, but. Yeah, that's the whole philosophy of EDM, right? That you are skeptical and you always keep uh, looking for the best quality of data that's going to come out. Absolutely. And the other thing I was going to say to you as well is I know, for example, in shoulder arthroplasty, so on my fellowship in Wrightington, they do really high volume of shoulders, like higher than anywhere else in the UK. And um, we used to always put, um, uh, I think it was gentamicin powder. We used to, especially with the revisions, we would put that in at the end around the prosthesis. But now I rang one of my bosses up recently and he said, apparently the evidence has shown that that can actually increase because um, because the big worry in shoulder is P acnes from the skin. And apparently now gentamicin powder, they don't use it anymore. So, so that's something which dogmatically we were doing for every case as well. Yeah, thank you, Richie, for that. I mean, that's very important. And uh, the other question is regarding, see, you mentioned about positive pressure ventilation during this pandemic. Now, how exactly is the airflow going to be when you talk about positive pressure ventilation? So it's a higher pressure inside the theater than outside. So I think the idea is that you're entraining the dirty air out of the theater. Um, it's something which they recommended during COVID, basically, that, that, that you should be using positive pressure ventilations in theatre, but the problem I have with positive pressure ventilation is it's very much dependent upon no disruptions in the flow of air. So if people are walking in and out theatre, if any doors open or anything like that, you're you're very much dependent upon you know uniform conditions within theatre. And we all know that during an operation, um, runners are going off to get equipment, going off here, so it's constantly being disturbed the airflow. But but I think that's what they've recommended. I, and I actually wanted to, I wanted to throw a question out to you guys because I think for the exam they're going to start bringing in things about infection control during COVID. I really think it's a very topical area. And what, what what's very your relevant. yeah? I mean, I really think it's quite. I, and I would actually encourage you guys to bring that into your answer now. So in the UK, for example, uh, we we've been doing this thing. It's it's been crazy where basically people have to have a negative um, test and then they self-isolate for two weeks before they can come in for an elective operation. So literally we've been having nothing on our elective lists. Um, now they've changed it that basically they say you've got to socially distance for two weeks, whatever that means, and then come in, you can have a negative test three days before. Um, so these are all yeah, exactly. So that's, I've talked to guys in the UK and that's, uh, I mean, everyone says that. So literally you're going to do COVID twice. Okay, yeah. so twice you're going to do the blood test and that's all going to increase the cost. For example, if you're in the NHS, NHS is going to cover all that, but in a private setup, that's going to be difficult, right? So additional expenses and uh, and also the, regarding the use of the personal protective equipment. We need uh, yes. uh, PPE. Are you guys, are you all using um, FFP3 for uh, operating? Yes, and the, uh, we use the personally protective equipment as well. And you can imagine, like when you said, the temperature, sometimes you wear too much of clothing and it's really hard. I found, I found using the FFP3 masks and especially the visors, I found it very difficult to be doing radiological cases, especially like I remember I was doing a capitellum fracture and I couldn't appreciate, there was a case where I slightly flexed the, I fixed the capitellum in slight flexion because for me, I was looking at the screen, it looked perfect. And then afterwards I took my mask off and I looked closer and I was like, Oh gosh, I flexed it by about ten degrees. 
I had uh, the same issue with an arthroscopy where the visor, I couldn't appreciate anything. So somehow I, I mean, I removed the visor for some time. What else to do? Yeah. I mean, I know. I know, I know. So I think, I think with this, with this topic, guys, I would really recommend you to bring in COVID stuff as well. Cause I think it's, it's definitely going to be part of the exam now. They're going to be bringing And uh, Ruchi, uh, before I hand over to Sentil, one more yeah. last question from my side. See, if we all talk about use of betadine as a skin preparation, right? So yeah. do you always, once you apply betadine, do you remove, I mean, do you use alcohol and remove that? Because the betadine is a count, I mean, is a skin irritant. It goes underneath the tunicate when you have problems, isn't it? I do. And I like, I like to have a, I like to have a clear sight as well, especially if I'm doing cases where I need to appreciate things like perfusion as well. So I like to like I put the betadine on and then I like to get it off with aqueous chlorhexidine afterwards. So it's a double prep, basically. Uh, Central uh, is also online. Central is a staff orthopedic surgeon in Texas who is a high volume surgeon. Central, your questions to uh, Rishi. Uh, Rishi, now again, a wonderful talk, you know, like uh, you covered a very extensive uh, topic this is you know it's hard to cover it in one session because each one of the topics you talked about you know like pre-op antibiotics antibiotic cement they all can be a talk on its own um so pre-op antibiotic what's your choice what's Normally, the, you, uh -huh. standard, standard operation kefiroxin if it's a joint tycongent tycoplanin gentamicin okay um especially if it's so, a revision, revision definitely tycoplanin gentamicin Okay, all right, because there are some uh, studies that show that cefloxin or cephalosporin should be part of all antibiotic prophylaxis, uh, mm -hmm. even if somebody had a previous, uh, you know, like a, as a positive MRSA colony or previous history of MRSA on the other side, you still, even if you are going to cover them with a VANC or if you have a gram negative infection, you cover them with a, a Genta, you still have to have a broad spectrum antibiotic. Uh, do you guys do that? You know. Yeah, same here. So the, as I said, normally kefiroxim is my go-to for everything. But if it's like a revision or sometimes for joints, if I'm worried, I'll do tyke it. We do tyke and gent, tyke and gent mm. Okay. Uh -huh. So yeah, because I know some surgeons just use vancomycin as a pre-op prophylaxis. Uh, but uh, I think that should be some for the exam. I don't know if that's going to be a correct answer if somebody. It was a uh, institute or a hospital has that policy of using rank for some patients, you know. So, um, and then using a betadine in the wound, do you do that? So at the end, like a betadine soak. Okay. Uh, so do, no, 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 you, no. Are you, are you talking about using like a betadine soak, like a wash? Yes, yes, yes into wash. the wound. I've done it on fellowship because the people I've worked for, they like to wash the wound with betadine, normally with a clean operating thing if it wasn't like a dirty wound like an open fracture of course yeah definitely but normally no wouldn't use it now just use standard okay. wash standard yeah wash. you know because i know quite a few of my colleagues and partners who use betadine in the wound um yeah yeah i think there is a what do you think about that what do you would you use it uh, I, i'm not still using it because most of the betadine available commercially are not uh, sterile betadine, they are clean mm -hmm. betadine. So, and then the, if you look at the rush data, they're talking about sterile betadine to reduce the risk of infection. So there are only like a few manufacturers, some of them in our, in, in US, it comes in the catheter pack as a small uh, pack. And then we have to open the catheter pack to get the sterile betadine. So, you know, that adds another logistic issue and cost wastage. So, right, and there is no strong recommendation as far as I'm aware. As for the routine use, so I'm not currently using, but if I get a commercially available sterile uh, betadine that comes with the joint uh, pack, the whole pack that comes with the cement and stuff, I would use it. I don't have a problem, you know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. What's your uh, experience, Asanta, with with COVID? Has have any of your practice changed in terms of infection control and things like um, that? Yeah, the positive ventilation is kind of making us a little nervous. So we are closely monitoring the infection rate in, in, the, in the ORs. So far, we haven't had any change, uh, difference in the infection rate in our uh, hospital. And um, we do pre-op COVID testing just one time, three days. Uh, seven, it has to be within 72 hours. And um, in emergency cases, when we don't do it, we kind of take them in, but then uh, it's kind of a 20 minutes of a uh, or time where it's uh, we wait for the aerosolized particles to settle yeah. down. Um, right now, 
I, when we are using uh, the surgical, uh, the exhaust suit, the striker guns, we try to wear N95 uh, because of the positive pressure ventilation, uh, because of the, the exhaust suit will suck in air into that and which will increase. So yeah, you, you can't go for the regular surgical mask. But for other cases where we don't wear the exhaust suit, I'm going with the regular surgical mask, uh, you know, uh, uh, recommended by the hospital. Mm. Other than that, um, I don't think uh, the post-op, we, we're, we're careful about uh, choosing our patients who don't go to the ICU where there is a higher chance of uh, COVID exposure. So we are kind of a little careful about doing sick patients. One, they are more susceptible to COVID. Two, they may end up in the ICU. So complex cases, we are still kind of a little careful about choosing our patients. You know? same, same with here. Elect electively, we're only doing ASA ones and twos. We've just got, mm -hmm. originally we weren't operating on anybody over 70 electively. It was ASA ones and twos less than 70. Now we're starting to introduce more complex cases, but it's a very uh, slow process. Like it's not, I haven't, I haven't done any elective joints since, uh, since COVID. It's only been yeah. fracture, fracture reverses, that type of thing. I haven't done any elective ones yet. Uh, yeah, pretty much the same here. We are, we are pretty much uh, starting to do some elective cases. Um, but not anywhere close to the way uh, volume we are doing, you know, so. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have any other questions. Uh, hit, okay, so, have... uh, yeah, so uh, Rishi, you know, before we conclude, uh, just mm -hmm. one last question to both of you. Actually, it's a pretty interesting orthopedic uh, joke that runs around. What is the difference between orthopedic, I mean, a carpenter and orthopedic surgeon? Between a carpenter and orthopedic surgeon? The, the person, the, the, um, what you're operating on, it, it, I don't know, the carpet is operating on a piece of wood. The orthopedic surgeon is operating on a patient. Then let me take your view on that. Oh, uh, no, I don't think uh, I have a good thing on it, you know? So. Okay, so the carpenter knows more than one antibiotic. <laughs> the orthopedic <laughs> surgeon knows only cefiroxine. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> That's a very common because every orthopedic surgeon, you know, he the most common orthopedic I mean agent that is used is cefiroxime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 so. Okay, well, if you're, I mean, in your viva anywhere, if someone asks you, okay, cefiroxime, safe answer. Yeah, and you'll you'll never be asked more than that on antibiotics. That table, you will never be asked more than that. I promise. So, so, any of you guys using more than twenty four hours of antibiotics in high risk patients? Uh, open I, practice. Open front no, 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 joints, 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 joints I'm okay. talking about, no, joints. It's three doses of antibiotics, isn't it? Yeah. That's it. Because yeah, there is some, uh, so some data coming up saying that in high-risk patients, the risk of infection is almost, I think if I remember it right, almost five times more compared to the regular patients. So there, is, so there was a paper from Michael Mengini, I think, uh, in JBGS talking about, uh, you know, very good uh, reduction in infection rate in high-risk patients if you use extended antibiotic up to seven days. So, so 24 hours of IV and then seven days of oral antibiotics. So, Yeah, same thing. You know what? I think most of the orthopedic surgeons are still continuing the practice. I've tried to change people that three doses of antibiotics is enough. They're not convinced. Yeah. Yeah. They have mm -hmm. not even reached that so that to them to move back to the seven antibiotics is very easy because they already have <laughs> seven day antibiotics. Yeah, I think I agree with that because I, you know, I came back to India for a few years and, uh, you know, like uh, depending on the kind of patients you deal with, I sometimes go for seven days of antibiotics, you know, now, at least when I was in India, I was doing that. And I do it sometimes here in US, like especially very high risk patient, prolonged surgery, you know, like a, a poor skin condition, like a poor, like it's not, so I kind of push it for uh, seven days, you know, sometimes we can think. The common excuse among uh, surge, I mean, uh, doctors or surgeons is that, see, these data, I mean, it's catered to a, a, a different set of population. You need to have your own local antibiotic policy. So that is what people say as an excuse. I mean, I don't know whether you can generalize it because three doses of antibiotics is almost like the norm. And like Senthil said, okay, in a particular scenario, okay, giving it for an extended period makes sense. Yeah, so... Rishi, any more, anything more to discuss or then we can... Uh... No, that was great. That was a really enjoyable meeting, guys. Thank you. And I really, it's really interesting to understand about other people's practices as well, because I think the whole... What I really love about these sessions is that we can really share ideas as well and learn from each other.
it's great because there's so, I think it's a really challenging t period now, this, this pandemic for everybody. And uh, uh, Barushi, just before we conclude, I just want to make one point between the Etardin and Saline debate. So what I look at is, I think it's a, a trade-off between right. Etardin and Saline. Uh, when you use Betardin, it's going to be, you're looking at uh, clearing the infection part. And yeah. because it's the, uh, I mean, the downside of Betardin is it's, going, it's not good for ostracides. Mm -hmm. So in a fracture healing scenario where I'm concerned with infection, it's an open fracture. I just do not hesitate in using. Yeah, then I use it definitely. I wash it. But down. when I'm concerned yeah. about, I mean, I'm not worried about infection. I'm not worried about contamination. I would just use saline. Saline, yeah, so, yeah, I agree. So I think it's a trade-off. It's, it? it, it's toxic to chondrocytes, I think, isn't it? They say the best. Exactly. Thing. It's uh, yeah, even osteocytes, osteoblasts is not good. Yeah. yeah. So again, as I told, this is a topic where we can keep on discussing one final yeah. thing, you know, like I do not use beta in for skin preparation. I use chlorprop. 12 years, I've not used beta and like, like I wouldn't say when I was in India, I did use beta in because we didn't have chlorprop. But yeah. uh, when I, in US, I never used uh, beta in, you know, so um, I think uh, it's great, you know, you don't have to kind of wait all the three minutes uh, stand time and stuff like that, and then again, take it off, you know, so. There's yeah. chlorhexidin, and, right? Yeah, chlorhexidin. Yeah. Chlorhexidin, so, yeah, yeah. and they also have uh, some uh, chlorhexidin so the for uh, wound irrigation inside the wound. It's called irisept. Yes. So you yes. can pour it into the. Yeah, yeah. We, that's been recommended for revision cases. So yeah. I used I've to work used for an orthopastic guy, and he used to do that as well, like with chlorhexidin. Yeah, it's still not indicated for primary or not enough data, but for revision there is decent data. Revision you mean for infected revision or non-infected? No, no, no. Clean revisions. Clean revisions. Uh -huh. Okay. So, so one, one last question I have for you guys is what's your view about drains in terms of the infection rate or, or bleeding or what, what's your view about that? Uh, center, you can take that. Yeah, kind of. I was a strong I've, proponent. I've changed of, my uh, mind a few times with that. You see, that's why I say. Yeah, that. hip. I've kind of moved away from it because most of the bleeding happens during surgery. Once you plug the canal, yeah. uh, your your bleeding is going to stop. You know, so the, the hip. Uh, I kind of moved away from it long time ago. But me, I kind of uh, uh, tend to say that it reduces the swelling. They do therapy well, even though there is no difference uh, uh, in most studies. I stayed with it, and I, and then I kind of slowly mustered my courage to move away from it because I, 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 there were a few groups where all of my partners were not using. So that gave me a reason to come out of it, and then I got used to it. You know, so now I can. Uh, do knees without a tourniquet and without a drain, oh, which no. were all my standard go-tos, like even a, a couple of years ago. So yeah. now I don't use drain, now I don't use uh, things. Uh, so I think it's not, I, I'm not seeing any difference. I'm yeah. still a Lovinox guy, but I'm kind of a current practice aspirin is more commonly used. So that further reduced the need for drain. So yeah, but uh, uh, I think I'm okay without the drain now. Now I wouldn't have said the same thing two years ago, you know, so. It's a difficult transition to make, but I think you have to do it in a setup where you have uh, uh, things standardized. So, Brilliant. thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions, I think we'll end the session. We've been thank talking you. for quite long, and it's pretty interesting to <laughs> share. I mean, uh, knowledge from different parts of the world. I mean, I'm in India, Rishi's in the UK, and Sandra is from the United States, and that gives an entire perspective of that's going to happen. Now. I mean, that's happening all over the world. Uh, thank you, Rishi, for joining in. Thank Fantastic you. lecture as usual. And we really look forward for another lecture from your side. And also thank you, Sentalin, for being our biggest support, always. Thank you. Oh, no, thank you. Rishi, it's really great. We I really enjoy listening to you. Well. Thank you. Yeah, lovely to see yeah, you. Both. Thank